uh, the, you could call these lessons or principles. But I'll tell you, when the promise is delayed, who's ever had a delayed promise? Wave at me, all right? If, when the promise is delayed, here's the first thing we don't need to do, all right? Number one, we don't need to attempt to assist God. Tell your neighbor, God can do it all by himself. God can do it all by himself. We don't have to help him along with that. Now, I want to tell you a little story about my life. Uh, about 21 years ago, I, had, I was a missionary, and I was stopping becoming a missionary. And I felt like God had called me out of that into the pastorate. And I had been putting out resumes and, and, and contacting places, being very active and being very active in my prayer life. I mean, hearing from God and walking with God. But, you know, uh, a church had not opened up that felt like it was the will of God for our life. And so uh, what happened? was that the day of my being a missionary came to an end. And uh, by the way, when that happened, so did the salary of being a missionary came to an end. How many of you realize that when the salary ends, the stress begins? Come on, somebody. And so I was, I was feeling a lot of that stress. And, and uh, so I remember the day specifically in my mind. I can see myself sitting there in that recliner. I had read the Word. I had prayed. And I finally told God this, all right? And maybe, you know, I know you're more spiritual than me. I was a little younger then. But anyway, I told God something like this. I said, okay, God, I need to provide for my family. If you're not going to open a door, if you're not going to have a church call me, I can't sit here and do nothing. I'm going to jump out there, and I'm going to go get myself a job because my children aren't going hungry. How many ever got that attitude with the Lord? Well, I have that attitude, right? So, man, I got him, and I'll be honest with you, I was upset. I got in my automobile, drove down the back down the driveway, went out Blue Sky Drive, made a left, came about three blocks, and there was a 7-Eleven wheeled in there. And on this, there was a big sign that said, looking for bilingual managers. Man, I got, I, boy, yo hablo espanol, que bueno, listo. Okay, so man, I wrote down the number, called on the called that telephone number, and I, it was just I had to answer question after question on the telephone, and then I hung up the phone. I said, "Well, okay." The very next day, the phone rang. Guess who it was? Seven Eleven. They said, "Are you Robert Millsaps?" I said, "I am." And they said, "This is Seven Eleven." Let me tell you, when they said that, all of a sudden. The Holy Spirit said, oh, that's what you're going to do, huh? Really? All that praying, all that believing, all that trusting. This is who you are. After all these years of me providing for you. After all these years of me opening up doors. After all, you can't trust me any more than that. Do you think that's right for you, Mr. B I mean, you know, it, how many of you know those thoughts can go through your mind in about 40 seconds, you know? And so that guy's talking about how he wants to have an interview. And I finally said, look, sir, I'm sorry, but I've got to trust God. Now, I'm going to tell you something. When I said that guy guess what I had in my bank account? I had about $35 in my bank account. I had no job. I had no income that was going to come in. My wife wasn't working and my children were going to want to eat the very next week. Come on. How many know what I'm talking about? But I said, God, I'm going to trust you. I mean, I was getting ahead of God. I was trying to do it myself. I said, God, if I was giving him a push. I'm going to tell you something. You don't have to give God a push. You know what happened? Less than 48 hours after that phone call, a man by the name of Bill Parker called me up. About 10 days after that, I was here at Houston. Amen. I, was, I became the pastor of this church, all right? That's kind of a long story. But what, what I'm saying is that God does not need our help. He can do it all by Himself. All right, now what's interesting here in this chapter, in the previous chapter here, uh, you know, in Genesis chapter 16, uh, introduces Sarai deciding to help the Lord a little bit, right? And uh, yeah, I'm going to call it the Hagar incident, all right? 
And in the previous chapter, we have Abram. He was struggling with it too. Hello. It wasn't just Sarah who had, didn't like waiting. He didn't like waiting. So he's before the Lord and he's saying, look, you know, I don't have an heir. Why don't you just take the head of my household, a guy named Eliezer, my head man, my right hand man, and he'll just become my heir. And God spoke to him and he said, absolutely not. Genesis 15 and verse 4, it says, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. And so Sarah undoubtedly knew all of this, and so she decides, well, I'm going to have to help the Lord out a little bit. And in Genesis 16, verses 1 through 3, let me read it for you. It says, now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. And she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. And Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband Abram to be his wife after Abram had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan. So he went into Hagar, and guess what? She conceived, right? And so at the moment she conceived, the moment she got pregnant, she started looking down on Sarah. Uh, Sarah and, and she, then a few months later, she had this little guy named Ishmael. And Ishmael, uh, you know, is born, you know, is born. And there winds up being a whole lot of family conflict because of that. And, and it's interesting that we in the Christian world, we look at that and we think, why would you do this? Maybe she was struggling in her faith, right? Maybe she had a moment of unbelief. Maybe she wanted Abram to see the promise God had given to him. And we have to remember that infertility in those days was different from today, right? They didn't understand all the medical things about it. They just assumed that, that God was, you know, stopping that, blocking that, that somehow they were cursed by the Lord. And so I just wonder if any of us can go back in our minds and we can remember the day you got ahead of the Lord. Is there anybody can remember that? That when you try to help God out, or am I the only one? Okay, I'll be the only one. That's all right. Well, let me just tell you something, okay? Here's the thing. If you can look back to a moment when you, when you really should have said, I'm going to be patient, God. I'm going to trust you, God. I'm going to believe you, God. I'm going to think that this thing is all going to work out, not the way I want it in my timing, the way I see it working out in my way, but in your timing, in your way, in your perfect will. I'm going to trust that. And you went ahead and did whatever it was that you did. I've got a little word for you this morning. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. It's all going to work out. It all worked out for Sarai. It's all going to work out for you, okay? Uh, Ishmael, in the end, became a, a great and mighty nation. And that was a beautiful thing. So uh, you've just got to continue to trust God, all right? And, and then the second thing you need to do when the promise is delayed long enough, number two, is we dare not laugh at the promise looking at the situation. Have you ever looked at a situation that you were up against and it just said impossible all over it. At least in your mind it did. With the natural eyes you're looking at it. The circumstances are horrendous. Nothing's going to change. The devil's whispering in your ear. It's too late. There's nothing that can be done. Disaster. Yeah. How many of you know Satan's a liar? Am I right? And sometimes we listen to him and, and sometimes what happens is people kind of just kind of snicker on the inside. Even at the possibility that God is going to show up. And I believe that when Sarai laughed, it was kind of, Sarah was her name then, it was kind of a cynical type of laugh. Now, I wanted you to understand that years have gone by now, okay? Started out, she was 65. Ten years later, she's 75. Now she's 89 years old, all right? And about that time, the Lord told Abram, you know, to change his name to Abraham, and he changed Sarai's name to Princess, to Sarah. So you got this guy who's 99 years old, and he's calling his wife, Princess, Princess, hey, Princess. Uh, you can imagine all of that, okay? 
And so when we get to Genesis chapter 18, and I, I don't quite understand all the way that God communicated back in those days. We have three men actually appearing on the earth, and the scripture calls one of them Lord, at least we know that. Was this a theophany? Was this the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't know who this was exactly, but Abraham gets up and he meets these men. He prepares them a meal, and in the midst of that conversation, Genesis 18 and verse number 9, the scripture says this, Then they said to him, Where is Sarah, your wife? And so he said, Here, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. Now what that means is about in about a year. He said, I'm going to return to you in about a year. And behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now hold on a minute. That was an absolute promise for Sarah. Am I right? Though God had said, Sarah is going to have a son. It was the promise of the Lord. And the scripture goes on to say, Sarah was listening in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham, now notice what it says, Abraham and Sarah, they were old. Come on, 99 and 89. And it says, well advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. And before we get too tough with Sarah, let's take a good look at the situation here. Come on. I mean, it said Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Hebrews 11 and verse number 12 says, Says, therefore from one man and him as good as dead apparently Abraham wasn't up for this either I mean those days seem to be gone okay and so 25 years ago she may have believed it but now she was chuckling within herself and so what I have to say about that is listen when you, God gives you a promise don't laugh about it okay because God can do anything am I right amen I, I, and so I don't know what it is that you're believing for but maybe the spirit of God is speaking to you and he's saying you know something God's going to send a great revival to Fountain of Life Christian Center and some would laugh and chuckle on the inside and say well yeah like that's going to happen let me tell you something it could happen come on somebody it's going to happen by the name of Jesus amen come on give the Lord a big hand of praise today maybe you're believing for a family member to be saved Right, and you tell that to one of your friends, and they laugh about it. They said, oh, yeah, right, that guy, that girl in the house of the Lord. Let me tell you something. There's no one that's beyond the reach of the grace of God. Come on. 